Okay, dear friends, we're going to start. Uh, so everyone, I hope everyone has found a seat. There are still some free seats over here if you're missing a seat. Uh, warmly welcome to this uh, event arranged by the Fish for the Future so-called campaign group in the parliament. We are a fairly new but very active uh, group that is pushing for an ambitious CFP reform, and I'm happy to see that there are so many others interested in the same topic as the room is almost full today and I'm also very happy to welcome a number of very distinguished uh, and experienced uh, speakers that will give us brief interventions on this topic and hopefully we will have enough time for a real debate today. So you're warmly welcome on behalf of the group and uh, on behalf of my colleague Mr. Gerbanyan Garbrandi and myself who are hosting this event. Uh, yesterday or was the day before there was a, an email circulated in the European Parliament uh, which uh, sh was a link to a report on the British Broadcasting Company, again proving how devastating the situation is of, of both the fish stocks and the state of the sea overall, with the uh, eco balance in a terrible state. Again, uh, reading this report uh, shows how important it is that we actually push for a real and an ambitious reform that takes in consideration the future of, of, of fisheries and the future possibility to actually eat European fish on, on the plates of, of us consumers. Uh, the Fish for the Future group has had a great start. We have great interest in, in the activities we're doing, and um, uh, I'm sure that, that with uh, common good work, we're going to be able to achieve a good reform. We also have a very, very good commissioner that's here with us today, warmly welcome, who we, of course, have great hopes in that she will deliver a very good reform package in, a, in, in the near future. And together with the commission and, and the council, we can hopefully change a lot of things. And, and the discussion today, of course, aims at, at getting good ideas for these changes. Our first speaker today will be Professor Colm Roberts, who will give us a brief overview of the fish stocks of Europe and the historic development. And I think that if you want to have a symbolic explanation, explanation of what this is about, you can look at our poster, um, where we can see that all the red fishes are more or less uh, non-existent anymore, and the others are still there and many of them are also overfished. And I think this uh, picture very well proves what our problem is today. Uh, I'm happy to see that the commissioner is studying this. It's <laughs> a very, very severe picture. And uh, Professor Roberts will give us an overview of, of why this is the case. And from there on, we'll, we'll start. So warmly welcome once more. Professor Roberts, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation here, and I'm very glad to see the uh, reform of the common fisheries policy and the recovery of European fish stocks is very high on the agenda here. Uh, the, my, my first slide is actually a, a 19th century painting, and the, the reason I put it up is because if you look at it, the only thing that's really different about it from today is the fact that there are little sailing boats on, on the sea instead of uh, big ships and, and wind farms and so on. But, Beneath the surface of the sea, it might as well be the same. And it's very easy for us to forget that the sea has changed a great deal uh, in the last century and a half since this painting was uh, produced. And what I want to try and do is to, is to reconstruct some of the history of European fish stocks and fisheries over the last uh, uh, 120 years or so, so that I can fill in the, the, what is going on and what is different about the below water part of this picture today. So this is a, a most of what I'm going to say is um, from uh, UK examples. And uh, I, I, I won't apologize for that. That's what we have studied in most detail. But I think that you can say that it, it is indicative of the uh, kinds of trends that we have had across Europe. If you look at the trends in different countries, and I would love to see more people put together this kind of information, the picture will be much the same. This is the, uh, the, the catch mountain for UK uh, bottom trawl fisheries since records began. We began to collect fishery statistics in 1889. So uh, my students and I have analyzed this time series, and you can see that catches climb up through the uh, late 19th century to the middle 20th century, and then they uh, fall away during the second part of the 20th century. And 
the thing about this is it, 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 it suggests that things are not all well with fisheries. And in fact, we were landing a lot more fish into the UK in 1889 uh, than we do today. And we had a sailing powered fishing fleet at that time. But this graph is also affected by the amount of fishing effort. So you can see the two big valleys in this uh, graph come from the world wars when it became too dangerous to fish. So if you want to get a better idea of what's going on with the fish stocks themselves, you have to divide the landings by the amount of fishing power being used to obtain them. And that's what this graph shows. And here you can see that uh, uh, we have an even bigger difference between 1889 and uh, the, the, the last few years. And uh, in 1889, in fact, the UK bottom trawl fleet caught 17 times more fish for every unit of fishing effort that they invested in catching them than they do today. And that reflects the fact that the fish stocks have declined enormously since the late 19th century. You can divide this graph into a number of phases. And uh, if you look at the first phase, what happened was that the fisheries intensified within Europe on the home grounds. And as the fishing technology was added, you see the uh, decline in the catch uh, per unit of fishing power. And then the second phase is um, after World War I, when people said, hey, look, you know, we can catch more going somewhere else. We've got big enough boats with engine power to do so. And so they went to the Arctic and West Africa and across the Atlantic. And so the landings per unit power climbed again. And then we have the introduction of exclusive economic zones during the 1970s. And uh, places like Iceland um, kicked uh, the, the rest of the European fleet out. And so we see uh, uh, declines. And uh, then we have, if there's a, a glimmer of, um, of hope <laughs> in terms of the culpability of the European Union for the problems, then, then I think that it, it is this. And the fact is, most of what happened, most of the decline happened on somebody else's watch. You were not um, involved in the governance problems that have led to this decline. On the other hand, European Union management of fisheries has not improved the situation at all. And so um, that's really what we have to deal with. And instead of tackling the situation at home, what has happened is that we've actually outsourced our overfishing problems to developing countries mainly. And uh, here's the number of access agreements that have been signed between Europe and uh, various developing countries. And so we're importing what we don't catch any longer. And if you, if you look at the difference, we, we import about 60% of what we uh, eat uh, in the way of seafood in Europe. And um, the evidence suggests that we could actually improve our domestic landings by a very similar figure if we manage those fisheries better. So to give you an idea of what the fish catches were like at the top of that graph, how, how uh, much more that we were catching in the past than we do today. This is an, an example of landings into one of the east coast ports in the UK, Grimsby. And here's another example of landings into uh, the port of Aberdeen. And what you can see is that the, the fish that people were catching at that time were so big that they were sold individually, uh, much as bluefin tuna are today in Japanese fish markets. So the auctioneers would go around and they'd sell one by one uh, each of these really big fish. So the landings were bigger, the fish were much bigger. But things have gone from bad to worse. Uh, uh, and what we have is a situation now where European seas are being fished down to the last drop. And, and to give you one example, this is the Firth of Clyde on the west coast of Scotland. And uh, we've looked at it in some detail. And what, what you can see here is the, the trends in the catches of many of the main fishery species caught using bottom trawls uh, from the Firth of Clyde during the, 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 the last uh, 40 or 50 years or so. And it, it's not just that the fish landings are low today, they're non-existent. The only things that are being caught in any numbers in the Firth of Clyde now are prawns and scallops. And so we've completely transformed that ecosystem from something which was once highly productive into something which is now highly simplified and productive only for one or two species. 
So our views of European fisheries have changed uh, a great deal in the last 50 years. After World War II, there was great optimism that the seas could feed the people of the planet. Today, uh, we know that we are uh, squandering that productivity and that we need to manage things differently if we're going to be able to recover it. So these are, to summarize, the trends that we've seen in European uh, marine environments. So not just in fisheries, but uh, we've seen a shift from plenty to shortage. We've seen a change in the size of things that we're catching. If you look at this uh, picture here, much of the big stuff is now uh, a, a minor element of the ecosystem. In the past, it used to be the major force driving the, the, the construction of ecosystems. We've seen the marine environment simplified from uh, many species down to a handful of species and from architecturally complex ecosystems to much simplified uh, sandy and muddy seabed habitats. And with these kinds of trends, we've also seen a shift from uh, things that uh, are functional and maintain a clean and healthy environment to things that are dysfunctional where we start getting harmful algal blooms and all sorts of other problems, jellyfish explosions uh, and the like. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because overfishing is not the only problem that we face. It's a very important part of the problem, but the marine environment is being stressed in many different ways. And we need to find ways of managing it so that the uh, marine life is able to cope with all of these different stresses together. Uh, if we're going to get uh, towards good environmental status for the sea, we need to be uh, putting the management in place, which means it's more, it's, uh, this is about more than just managing fish for fisheries productivity. But the, the, the good news is that um, managing the fish stocks for better fisheries productivity is actually the best way to enable marine ecosystems to withstand the problems of these other stresses. Now, the best way to uh, improve the state of European fisheries is simply to rebuild them. Uh, and if you imagine the stocks of fish that we have in the sea right now is this uh, this uh, larger bag of money here and the amount that we catch from those stocks, the, the interest rate, if you like, as a smaller bag of money, uh, we're not getting very much interest. We're not getting very much yield from them. But if we were to rebuild the fish stocks uh, uh, over time, then we would have a much larger capital stock in the sea and we would get a much larger productivity from it in terms of what we could land, uh, even though the interest rate, uh, the, the productivity, is effectively the same. So having more fish in the sea makes excellent sense. And it also will lead the sea to be better able to cope with all of the different stresses that are out there. Because more fish means uh, a greater um, throughput of uh, ecological processes that determine things like the rate at which water is filtered and purified and um, the, way, the rate at which carbon is, uh, is uh, trapped and locked away in seabed sediments and so forth. All of these things which are very important to us as a society uh, but have been lost in the, in, in the race to get uh, the last fish. So I think uh, this is just a, a preamble to what everyone here uh, knows is necessary, which is a very strong and conservation-minded reform at the heart of the common fisheries policy. The good news is that marine ecosystems are resilient and they can recover, and we've seen them recover very quickly uh, in some parts of the world where the right management has been put in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. That was uh, very clear and outspoken. Um, I think the good news from your presentation was that the biggest damage had already been done before the common fisheries policy was introduced. Um, the bad news was that the common fisheries policy did not improve uh, the situation. Um, but that is going to change, uh, thanks to uh, our commissioner that uh, we're very honored to have here uh, at this table. So I'd like to give her the floor and to explain how we are going to change the common fisheries policy. I'm not sure that we're going to change the fisheries policy. What I can promise is that uh, I'm trying now to have a good proposal on behalf of the Commission, an efficient proposal, 
And afterwards, I hope that the Parliament and the Council will adopt good solutions. But anyway, what I would like to say is that I would like to thank you for organizing this event. I would like also to thank uh, all parliamentarians that uh, have organized this campaign on the future of fishing. And I'm very pleased to see so many people here. It's, it's uh, very good news that so many members of parliament and other people are interested in this issue. So this is our hope, after all. So the Fish for the Future group, and uh, I have already discussed the problems of the current uh, fisheries reform policy of uh, what we are going to do. And in general, I can say that we have established that we are on the same page. So uh, what I would like to underline today, and uh, I'm going to give you some facts on it, is um, I would like to share with you what would happen if no reform took place. I think that uh, I have something to add to what uh, already <laughs> was mentioned. Uh, I'm waiting uh, also for two reports who are going to be published tomorrow. And I hope that um, uh, we lend this discussion and everybody here will have a very clear view um, of our future. So what I can generally say is that without a reform, the, sp the prospects are grim, are really grim. I'm not exaggerating. They are really grim. In general terms, it's easy to see that if we don't act, we will lose one fish stock after the other, and this will have two major consequences. One is uh, that since nature doesn't like voids, other species will take their place. This is something we have not explored enough till now, but this will happen. So we'll have a chain reaction of effects that is hard to predict and we will have changed the ecosystem forever. And this will not be for good, I'm afraid. The second is that the industry will face even more economic pressure. Sometimes I receive uh, so many complaints from the industry about my intentions, about my proposals. But uh, what we have to realize uh, is that uh, if we keep the things as they are now, if we keep the status quo, the situation will not be good even for the industry. They have to realize this themselves because we are going to lose jobs, but not just in the fishing sector itself, also in the processing industry, in transport, in port infrastructure, at auctions, down to packagers and retailers. And all of us as consumers will end up with less fish in our plates. So these are the general considerations and we have uh, heard a lot about it. But uh, today I would like to be more specific because the commission just carried out some modeling exercises to define what happens under different scenarios over a time horizon until 2022. So we had these studies we have this horizon, 2022, and we are studying what is going to happen under different scenarios. So it appears that if we were to continue with the current uh, common fisheries policy, the best case scenario would be modest progress for some stocks over many years. We are going to have some modest progress for some stocks over many years, and I'll explain what I mean by that. However, at the end of the day, we would be very, very far from the environmental, economic, and social objectives that we have set for European fisheries. So, let's assume that we continue along the path of the 2002 legislation. Let's keep the legislation as it is. Let's even assume that we follow our last year's decisions, which were better. <coughs> last year, we had some improvement. We had some better decisions in the council, and I, I uh, was uh, very clear about it. 
let's assume that we are going on after these better decisions. We freeze the situation as it was the uh, last year. And also, uh, let's assume that we have freeze what we have done under the Lisbon Treaty. And also, let's assume that we uh, are going to finish and we are going to be to have a good uh, outcome from all the long-term management plans we have now under the pipeline. Let's assume that we'll finish all this and we go for it. And also, let's assume that there are no changes to the current financial instrument um, or uh, to our external policy. So, what will happen? Let's uh, discuss environment first. We know that in this scenario, 9% of our stocks would be sustainable at sustainable levels by 2022. 9%, let's say 10% of our stocks will be at sustainable levels by 2022. These stocks will be basically the stocks covered by long-term management plans. So these stocks will be at sustainable levels. The others would be heading towards collapse. I believe this figure requires no further comment. Because as you can understand, me as a commissioner and the commission, we cannot simply take the risk of potentially endangering 91% of the fish stocks, because this will be the case. If we keep the things as they are now, after all the improvements we had during the last year, if we are going to finish all the long management plans, if we are going to do everything the best we can, then 90% of the stocks will be in a danger. These are clear figure, figures, these are facts. At the same time, what about the fleet? Because this is also something important. So fleet size would shrink in 10 years by 15%. In the best case scenario, we'll have a decrease of the fleet by 15% in terms of number of vessels. Well, we have here a modest reduction, but I have to see that uh, I have to say that this reduction would be offset by our increasing technological power, the, troller, the trollers we have mentioned before. And then this means that overcapacity, the main driver of all our problems, would remain, as would overfishing and the high level of discards. So here are the results I have received. Economically speaking, some fleets would still be profitable. This is true. But all the fleets would be very vulnerable to fluctuations in first sale prices or fuel prices. The overall financial performance of the EU fleet would not improve, would be as it is today. And we have uh, still to put up with the constant demands for higher higher fishing limits on the part of the sector. We have to go through the exercise we, had, we have at the end of the year. Each year I'm going to the council and each year I have to face the demands for fishing more by the industry. And also we still be likely to have to depart from scientific advice. What is more important? What is more important? Uh, what under my opinion, of course, is that we are going to continue to face a steady need to subsidize the sector. This is something we have to decide. We have to be very serious about it. Maintaining the current level of subsidies would simply postpone the inevitable end and would do this at a high cost to taxpayers. So I have to go to the taxpayers and say to them that we have give money to the commission to subsidize the fleet because this will be the consequence. And in this perspective, subsidies such as the current Axis one of the European Fisheries Fund bear a heavy environmental cost and throw us deeper into the vicious circle. <coughs> but let me inform you about this. I have received a statement by some member states and they clearly want 
to go on with these subsidies. Very important member states. So we have to face the reality. I have received this statement by a lot of member states who can vote in the council and block everything. So you are parliamentarians, you are uh, leaders of the public opinion, you have to help if you want a real change. Otherwise, we have to go subsidize the fleet on our taxpayers' money. We are talking a lot about uh, the crisis. Well, I'm coming from Greece, so as you can imagine, <laughs> I talk a lot, but all the commission, all the commission is talking a lot about the crisis and the, the council and the parliament and everybody, and uh, on the other hand, I have to face this situation. I have to go to the council and receive these demands for going on with the subsidies. If we are going on with the subsidies, it will cost a lot. I have to persuade the taxpayers that I have to give millions of euros, millions of euros to our fleets just to reduce overcapacity 1% per year. 1% per year. And this will cost a lot of millions of euros. So you have to tell the ministers of France, of Spain, of Portugal, I don't know who else, Germany. I, I'm afraid that Germany also subscribes this text about giving more subsidies to the fleet vessels. So this is the situation. So let's go to the social sustainability. I already said that if we are going like this, jobs would be lost. Also wages would remain below the national average and safety conditions, don't forget safety conditions, they would not significantly improve. I would like to be clear with you, though. I would like to be completely sincere. And uh, let me say, in a very direct way, whatever we do, whatever opinion we analyze, even if we have the best reform, if we do everything, we will have to accept some decline in the employment rates of the catching sector. I have to be sincere with you. I cannot hide the truth from you. I would like to be completely honest. But I think that this cut will be lower if we are going for a reform. This decrease will be lower, and uh, it will be especially in the short term. I hope that afterwards we'll have <coughs> an increase again. If we shrink the fleet, the staff working on the fleet will have to be helped to find another occupation elsewhere. However, we should not be tempted to artificially keep some jobs in the catching sector in the short term. This is my opinion. Why I'm saying that? Though the temptation is very, very pushing, eh? I face the temptation of artificially keeping these jobs, but the price to pay is too high. The taxpayers, they have even, even the poor taxpayers, even the taxpayers that are be given a salary of 8,000 uh, 8, euros or less in the middle of the crisis, they have to pay for giving, for keeping these jobs artificially there. This is the real truth and we have to face it. Without change, the decline in fish stocks would lead to an even greater loss of jobs. This is something also we have to understand. There is no way out. If we subsidize more, then we are going to fish more, and at the end, we'll have a greater, a deeper loss of the jobs. This is the truth. So in reality, also, if we look at wages, the current uh, policy would perform far worse than any of the reform scenarios. And the quality of employment measured in terms of safety at work could also get far better under the reform. These wage levels, employment, working conditions are the really important parameters we should consider. Not only because it is fair to the fishermen, 
but also because these are the things that may attract new people toward the fishing procession. Let us not forget that employment in the catching sector has been steadily declining in the last 15 years. So this is my answer. If we are going like this, we are going to decline, to have the employment declining. Accordingly to a study we recently conducted, fishermen are now changing fishing behavior. People are turning toward other fisheries related activities like processing and aquaculture, or are diversifying in favor of other maritime sectors, tourism in the first place but also offshore energy, oil, gas, and so on. So this is a positive trend which we seek to accompany with the axis four of the current fisheries fund. There is also the aspect of governance to consider. The CFP has a very complex legal framework which makes it very hard to implement and enforce. You know, all, you, all of you know about it. So maintaining the current structure would mean continuing with micromanagement at the highest political level and more decision, bureaucratic decisions to the detriment of effectiveness and compliance. Finally, the external dimension of our policy has performed worse than expected, I have to admit. There is room for improvement, not only as regard environmental sustainability, but also in terms of international governance. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. Environmental, economic, and social sustainability are equally important facets of the same issue. Without environmental sustainability, it will be impossible to ensure any economically profitable and socially viable future for the fishing sector. Business as usual, will consign us to a gradual decline and we can no longer afford it. Instead, we need to shift the focal point of our common policy. We need to move away from half measures and last minute crisis management toward a long-term proactive common fisheries policy. Change will not be possible without support from members of the European Parliament. Change will not be possible without support from members of the national parliaments, from member states, from NGOs, from industry and consumers, of course. So I count on your constructive support to make this change possible. Without a reform, the loss of fish stocks and the decline of the fishing sector will be inevitable. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Commissioner. Um, I think you never, um, you're always so outspoken and clear, and you, you never disappoint the audience. I think that is a great thing. And hearing what you were saying, I was wondering if you have the weekends off to save your own country, because that would be a great idea to do. Um, I think you made very clear that there are environmental, social and economical reasons for not just changing the common fisheries policy, but changing it in a radical way. Um, I don't see any other reasons why we should not change it in that way. And uh, you were mentioning a few member states. Um, I'll name them again. France, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Belgium signed a joint declaration um, actually declaring that they didn't want any changes to the, um, uh, at least to the financial instrument of the fisheries policy. Um, I think your arguments are so strong that it's very difficult for them to uh, face the people on the street with their arguments. And I hope that we are able uh, in this parliament, but also outside this parliament, to have a serious open debate on, on this issue, because that will help definitely. Um, let me welcome also a lot of members of this parliament that I uh, see among the crowd. Uh, thank you very much for coming, not only all the members, but also from the other groups. I think that's a very uh, positive sign about the work we're doing. Um, let me 
move quickly to our next speaker, uh, Luis Rodriguez. Um, he is uh, an artisanal uh, fisherman from Galicia and uh, has been fishing for 23 years, uh, if I'm well informed. And he has seen the changes with his own eyes and has some ideas about how to do it in the future. Please. Good afternoon, first of all. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. My name is Luis Rodriguez. I'm a small-scale fisherman and I'm a representative from a fishing association in Galicia in Spain. There are 5,000 small-scale fishing boats active in the area. But we make up about 6% of the total European fishing fleet. Uh, we very much appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. We can describe the pro problem citing fig facts and figures, and I would like to contribute to this meeting with the experience I myself have gathered. It's essential that we manage the whole system from fishing to distribution, and based on my personal experience, I would like to tell you a little bit about our experience as fishermen, the thousands of fishermen who are active here in Europe. Small scale fishing, I would say, is a very different world from industrial and sem semi industrial scale fishing. We are ecologically minded, we have a different way of fishing economically, we are very, very different when it comes to our attitudes towards managing marine environments. We are different in terms of economic aspects as well. In the current economic crisis, this is something we must bear in mind, especially when thinking about the jobs provided in the sector. We need to adopt policies that are appropriate, and if we do this, we will be creating lots of opportunities for social and economic development. But with the rise of new technology, we are really in uncharted territory right now. And this is the case because, well, we have to understand exactly what's going on. And when we do understand it, we will see that the way things have been managed, the way things have been funded, it has always been about supporting the large fleets, the large industrial fleets. And we have endangered the types of species that are targeted by large-scale fishing fleets. And this has been to the detriment of small-scale fishermen. Small-scale fishing has been discriminated against in terms of the uh, distribution of quotas and the distribution of fishing opportunities. We've been accused of uh, excessive fishing capacity, excessive fishing powers, which is only true, actually, for the industrial fishing fleets. Despite the problem of coastal pollution, uh, and this being something that we try to combat, we have been discriminated against. Now, we are productive and we, are, we offer an alternative way of fishing and alternative opportunities. And now really is the time to change the reality when it comes to fishing. We need to generate jobs, we need to uh, develop the wealth of fishing opportunities for Spain and Europe. Now, small-scale fishing species are still served up today, and there are many other species that can still be served up sustainably whilst maintaining the jobs for our fishermen. All of this is possible, but if we want to make sure that this remains the case, we have to move from um, grand statements to actual, actually taking action. This action needs to come urgently. We need a very, very clear, precise decision on a clear definition of small-scale uh, fishing in Spain and in Europe. We need this definition now, and we, and we need to do this so that it is accepted by all small-scale fishermen across Europe. This really will transform our type of fishing, our form of fishing. We need to define exactly what constitutes small-scale fishing. And we want this definition to be 
drawn up quickly and in a clear way. We also need dedicated funds directed towards this branch of fishing in Europe. And let it be very, very clear, we're talking about a productive type of fishing that is useful for our marine eco ecosystems, that makes a positive contribution to fishing communities in Europe. And this is all about recovering the most fragile fish stocks and combating the problem of pollution, which is damaging and uh, problematic for all coastal populations. This is all about exploiting the opportunities we have for diversification in fishing. In our view, this is the real way forward towards sustainable fishing and the sustainable use of our coastal and marine resources. If we want to maintain biodiversity, this is the only way forward. And in this forum, what I really want to do is to invite the Commissioner to um, visit our fleets in Galicia to see with her own eyes exactly how we use the resources in the area. We would be honoured to um, receive the Commissioner in our region and I'm sure that you will find that your visit will be a very positive experience and you will see just how important these issues are for us. And finally, let me say that the fishing sector is very much committed to change. We do have to express our ideas more clearly. We need to implement our initiatives in the best way possible. We have to improve cooperation with various associations and interested parties. The fishing sector needs to be intrinsically involved in the decision-making process because their future depends on it. We, of course, have to uh, listen to the scientific community and environmental organizations, too. So I am here today as a fisherman, and I represent thousands of small-scale fishermen who, like myself, are finding it very difficult to carry on with their fishing activities. And I'm not here just to criticize. I'm here to explain to you the problems that we're facing and our vision of the future. We see that there are opportunities with science and environmental uh, research. We do see a way forward to sustainable fishing. So let me re reiterate once again my invitation to the members of parliament, to the commissioner and the environmental organizations. My fishing boat, my fleet, and my region are open to receive you so that we can show you exactly how we carry out our small-scale fishing activities in the region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Rodriguez. I, I think if you talk about the social dimension of fisheries, um, your statements were, were very clear and, and to the point. I would now like to, to shift over to this side of the table and to discuss more the economic uh, side of fisheries and also the future economic side of fisheries. And I'd like to start by giving Mr. Guus Pastor the floor. He is um, the president of the European Federation of Processors and Importers, Exporters of Fish. Um, he's also a member of the European Commission's Advisory Council for Fishery Affairs and a board member of the Seafood Importers Alliance. So if anyone knows fish, I think it's Mr. Pastor. He must have listened um, with pleasure to the Commissioner because I have a quote from him saying, the objective of the CEP should be to rebuild stocks to, future, to meet future demand and maximize the potential of fisheries as valuable and renewable sources of protein, and there we come, not simply to manage the status quo. I think that's a plea for change as well. Mr. Pastor, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you for the invitation. And within this introduction, of course, uh, you've put me in an, an area where I cannot get back anymore, so I'll uh, try to explain what we mean by all these nice quotes and all these nice words. Now, um, representing the processing and the trading companies, uh, I would like to take a, a pragmatic approach and, and simply uh, look at three points 
where we think we need to focus the discussion. Now, first of all, effective regionalization. The second one, long-term management plans. And the third one, as quoted, maximizing value of fish. So first of all, this regionalization. Now, what we've seen happening over the last years, I think could be easily demonstrated with a few simple lines. We've seen that the CFP being very centralized, uh, a very centralized decision-making process has led to a situation where fishermen don't really feel involved uh, in this policy. And I don't think we can blame just the fishermen for everything that's happening. It's the policy which has put us in a certain area. Many of them don't feel that their specific situation is recognized at all. And then they don't think that the fish stocks are assessed in a proper way. This is what we hear when we speak to those who are supplying us. And it's obvious that the differences between fisheries in different areas and different fisheries as such are far too big to try to handle that with one policy. That's not giving credit to what these people are trying to do, and it's not giving credit to our fish stocks. So for us, this is an essential point in the reform of the policy. We need to try to get a, a better stakeholder involvement at a more regional level. Because the effect has been that we've seen that political decisions have been taken not always based on the best science. I think we need to invest a lot more in this area. Uh, fishermen have become demotivated to adhere to the rules because they don't find them appropriate sometimes and often they don't even understand the rules. Uh, and often they're not able to move in a flexible way. They're not able to work as they would like to work. And that all has led us to a situation where we are at the moment. Some stocks are severely deteriorated. Some others are not, by, uh, by the other way, as the commission demonstrated, it's a mix. Um, but what also happened is that the markets deteriorated. Market acceptance for several species has deteriorated, which has led us to a situation where prices have gone down because consumers don't consider the fish to be sustainable. And if that's the situation, then you're going downwards because you cannot evolve in your markets. So if we don't change the CFP, and I think that was the basic question today, what's going to happen if we don't do anything? Well, then we would expect that we would go on in this path where consumers will turn away from certain species, certain fish species, and this will have a negative economic effect on all operators, fishermen and those who are down the chain as we are. Second point, long-term management plans. Uh, in the current system, we do see some improvements, and I think the Commissioner was right to point out that there have been some long-term management plans set up, and they have, for a part, been successful. So I think it's a very good example. But many uh, stocks are still managed on a short-term approach with yearly quota settings. And what happens? What happens is that you are implementing a high financial risk for fishermen and processors and even retailers, because everybody would like to see a more stable supply situation with more stable prices. Now, this we can only, at the moment, we can only supply the fish at large financial risk because you have to deliver to retailers who want contracts for a longer term. And you don't know if the fish is going to be there, and you don't know what the price is going to be. Long-term marketing plans are hindered because if you're not certain that you're going to sell this fish during a certain period, you're not going to invest in promotion. Investment uh, willingness will go down, and bankers are less prepared to finance because you're not in a healthy situation. So again, if we don't turn to long-term management plans for all fisheries, then we'll see that investment in improving efficiency, investment in product development, marketing, it will lag behind. And the result will be that we will have a meager financial perspective. And my last point, the most difficult one, I think, maximizing value of fish. Short-term decisions, which we have seen over the years, have often been a reason for non-rational behavior for play economic players. And sometimes they have been strengthened by perverse financial initiatives, incentives, which led to a situation where fish could be landed in the wrong time or in the wrong place or the wrong species. And that means that you're not exploiting your market potential fully. Now, in some fisheries, we believe that the system of ITQs could be a better option because here you would bring ownership to some of the fishermen 
uh, and also it may be a way to tackle overcapacity. And we've seen some examples where it does work. Now, we don't know if it's applicable in all fisheries, but at least it's, it's one way to try in, in certain fisheries. Because fish is a highly valuable source of protein, it's healthy, and uh, once we've overcome our fears how to do it, we can prepare very nice food for ourselves and our kids. Uh, and we believe that we are forgetting that we're part of the food business because demand is growing. And it will, so, it will do so if we provide the customers with the fish they're asking for. So if we don't change the CFP, we won't be able to provide the market uh, with the type of fish the consumers are asking for, and we will be missing economic potential because we're part of the food business and fish is part of a global market. So if we don't supply the fish, we will know that in a situation where the world population is going up, where developing countries are having rising income, the competition for fish is going to increase very severely. We're going to see that prices will go up like all other foodstuffs are doing at the moment. And if the EU cannot provide the fish we want to buy as consumers, it's going to come from somewhere else because the market is global. But if we have more sustainable fish and it's available from our own EU fisheries, then of course processors and traders would like to buy that fish and retailers would like to buy that fish. So we could improve the economic situation. Now, our next speaker, Alex, is out of me. He will, is one of our member companies, and uh, I believe he will be capable to show some examples of how situations can improve if you follow these lines I was just sort of uh, giving to you. Um, and as I just indicated, I think one of the main elements is to get a better stakeholder involvement. And if you can do that, then you can move forward by binding all parties. So I think our long-term interests are clear, and I also believe that most of us should share those long-term interests, but the challenge will be to find ways out to overcome the transitional period and to get out of the short-term problems towards long-term solutions. And I think here Commissioner has a, a, a great, great challenge, uh, and we hope that she can succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pastor, and also thank you for making the bridge to your colleague, uh, Mr. Alex Olsen, who is um, from the, no, he is the Group Project Manager for Sustainable Production within the Esperson Group, and that's the fish supplier for McDonald's Europe. Please, Mr. Olsen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, actually, I'm here to support the reform of, of CF, CFP. Like just uh, like Pasteur said, we, we need urgently long-term management plan for all stocks in within the um, EU, and I also think we need a more decentralized management system to avoid micromanagement. Just to mention a few, uh, I am representing Esperson, and we are the sole supplier of fish to uh, to in Europe to McDonald's, and we have a partnership with McDonald's which go back more than 40 years. And I actually been working with for McDonald's for 12 years before I joined uh, Esperson Group. McDonald's customers consume more than 100 million fiddle fish sandwiches each year, which is equal, equ equivalent to approximately 7,000 tons of uh, fish per year. And this, of course, only a part of what we are in our group is a, have as, as annual production. Sustainable fish stock are crucial for our business as, a, as well as a, is for McDonald's. Without fish, no production, no product. It's as simple as that. Uh, and I believe that a sustainable production is not only beneficial for us, Esperson, but perhaps even more for the local fishermen and for the local community. So it's basically a win-win-win situation if we get the stocks back to, to sustainable levels. Even though I believe that sustainability of fish stock is it's, it's, it's actually too important to, uh, to leave to the political system only. I hope that the European Parliament, the, the Commission, will actually make this work and make the, the changes necessary for us as, uh, as uh, depending on the fish stocks. I really hope that. But I'm, instead of focusing on what should be in the, the common fishery policy, I'm going to tell you a little story from the Baltic Sea and the Baltic Cod which is so close to my heart and so close to the heart of our company. 
which is actually a good story, which illustrates what can be done if we decide to do something. Um, just a little bit background, if just to, coming back to some of the comments mentioned earlier and the, 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 the statistics, looking at the fishing opportunity for 2012, uh, it's mentioned that 50 to 60 percent of the cut in EU is uh, uh, outside safe biological lim limits, uh, which of course is a very bad story. And one of the, the stocks that was in that situation a few years ago was actually the Baltic, uh, the Baltic cod, which was referred to as a species being on the brink of extinction, mainly due to overfishing. And as a consequence of that, McDonald's actually stopped sourcing fish from here. And this is the first time McDonald's has taken uh, such an action. However, in agreement with McDonald's, we worked with NGOs, authorities, and fishermen to improve the sustainability. Basically, the philosophy is always better to be a part of the solution than to be a part of the problem. We challenge fishery to accept standards and auditing and pursue uh, the EU to clamp down on illegal uh, fishing. Uh, and, at and we, at the same time, got a, a long-term management plan, a recovery plan for the Baltic Sea Cod. And this was crucial uh, for the whole stock development in the, uh, up till now. But still, when we in the summer of 2009 announced that we were working on an MSC certification on the cut, many expressed a certain amount of skepticism. Uh, we were, however, convinced that the, the initiatives launched by the authorities, not least the Polish government, who, who was uh, really implementing strong measurements and control uh, instruction in the, in the harpers, uh, this would make the certification obtainable. And the first Baltic cod fishery was certified, certified April this year. And uh, later we got the two others. Uh, one is already in and the next one is coming within a few months. Uh, we choose Marine Stewardship Council certification uh, because it's, this is, in our view, the most robust and relevant independent third-party program. MSC is a science-based program which demands that the impact and management of each participation in the participating in fishery is assessed in the light of scientific evidence. For us, it's ex extremely important that any decision made will be based on the best available facts uh, at that time. With the Eastern Baltic Cod certification, McDonald's announced a few weeks ago that from October, all fish sold in, Euro in European restaurants will be MSC certified from the 1st of October. All fish, uh, which means that every day over 30, 30 million customers in Europe will be exposed to the existence of a sustainable fishery. And that all sustainable fish will be served to, to millions of people, make it even more accessible to consumers than even before. It's 7,000 restaurants in 39 European countries will have the blue marine stewardship label on the packaging from October. It's not that, uh, that Esperson or McDonald's haven't been doing anything on sustainability until now. McDonald's has, uh, have worked 10 years with us and other suppliers to actually uh, assess fish stocks. And we have been focused uh, together with a uh, have a special policy on, on uh, assessing fish stocks, which is done annually. We have focused on improving the quality of fish stocks and the li livelihood uh, of the entire supply chain and, re and rely on, on them. All fish stock used globally by McDonald's have to, be, have to undergo, undergo an annual assessment. We are pleased that co Commissioner is taking the real steps towards significant reform of the CFP and hope that EU governments recognizing the urgent need for change before it's too late. I'm looking forward to seeing the way that the new EU's EU policy will provide a safe future for all our oceans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Olsen. It, it shows the importance of big companies and big consumers of fish to, um, to work on a more sustainable way of, of dealing with the issue. Um, you men mentioned the Marine Stewardship Council, um, Mr. Tony Long from WWF. WWF has been one of the initiators of this uh, MSC label. Um, 
it shows the way WWF is working, not just saying no, 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 but trying to find ways to, to uh, come to improvements. I'd like to give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Gerbignan, and thank you very much to the FISH for the Future Group for convening this meeting and, uh, and, and for inviting me. I'm delighted that the room is so full, and I think that's a portent for the next 18 months while we talk about the reform that these sorts of meetings are going to be the norm, and this kind of attendance, I trust, will be the norm. Just to remind you, this is a once in a 10 year reform of the common fisheries policy. If we get this one wrong, then the next reform will be in 2022. And based on what we've heard from Professor Callum Roberts and what we've heard also from Commissioner Maria Damanaki, the future would be indeed very grim in 2022 if this reform doesn't work. So it's in fact incumbent upon us all to make sure that we get this right. I just want to emphasize, I represent the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF. What we're talking here is a massive public policy failure where biodiversity is the victim. The biodiversity of the oceans covering 90% of the planet's surface is suffering enormously. And it's, it's happening on our watch and this is as big as biodiversity challenge for the future of the planet as we can possibly imagine. Another reason to get this right. So how do we move this whole sector? How do we move the industry from the point where it's often perceived as failing or often perceived as uh, a downward trend on the graph? How do we change the image of the sector? How do we change the image of fishing? And that's what I think lies at the heart of this reform is an attitudinal change. And that's very difficult to legislate for, but it's actually what we need to bring about. And I have five proposals for bringing about that attitudinal change. The first is that we must endorse a long-term vision of fisheries with management plans that are tailored to the specificities of each fishery in Europe and which contain clear environmental targets. It is this vision which will inspire and empower regions and fishers and catchers to do the right thing and not to be seen as the problem child, but to be seen as part of a responsible, thriving, growing, valuable industry. The second is very similar in some ways, but it's that all decisions and all policies and all implementation arrangements under the next common fisheries policy reform must go together as a coherent whole. This is not a policy where you pick out X or Y and, and solve those individually. The whole thing must go together. And I urge the commissioner, please, you and your college uh, compatriots, bring out, please, the strongest, most possible coherent package on the 13th of July so that we can look at it, at least at that time, as a coherent whole before others start to try to fine tune and adjust and micromanage. Let's see the policy in its best and most robust form when it comes out. Thirdly, I would say that environmental sustainability must be the preeminent goal in the trinity of the economic, social, and environmental uh, pillars. Without fish, there is no fishing industry. Without a fishing industry, there are no fishing communities. In fact, the whole very definition of sustainability actually derives from natural resource products like timber and fish and, and, and other renewable resources. Because if you kill your feedstock, if you take your juvenile fish stock before they've had a chance to reproduce, You've got no fishery. So environment must be the centerpiece of the sustainability challenge. Fourthly, I think, and it's symbolized by the, the bags of money that uh, Callum Roberts put up, we've got to have a, a, a sector that's valuable. 
We've got to have a sector that's got more money in it. We've got to remove some of the tainted images of a sector which has got illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. That's got to go if we want to have value in this industry. Illegal fishing has got to go. So too has the whole problem of discards, the, the dropping overboard of dead fish, 50% of the catch. All of that image that, that, that shakes at the value of this industry has got to disappear. I believe the subsidy debate that we had earlier is part of that as well. Get rid of the, 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 the crutch that the industry is, 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 is leaning on. And then we get the high value sector that the processors, the retailers, and the catchers are looking for. And finally, all these reforms must apply, the fifth point, in the context of our third country fishing agreements, in our participation in the regional fisheries management organizations, on the high seas, and indeed anywhere where European fishing fleets operate. We must have a coherence, and we must stand up for our principles as Europe, wherever we're fishing, and indeed to safeguard some of the most precious artisanal fishing communities in the world, some of the poorest. So I spoke, Chairman Finishing, I spoke about f policy failure. It doesn't need to be. I think fisheries management is one of the areas where practical solutions are available and are achievable and are demonstrable. So I, I, I believe very much that this next reform, the next uh, 18 months leading to that reform and then the next eight years for implementing can actually achieve the high value industry that WWF and indeed nature is looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. That was, uh, that was very good. And if, if I listen to the scientific, the policy, the social, economic, and environmental elements of this policy, you all sh seem to share the same vision. So I think um, we might be in a, in a better situation than we believe, policy speaking. I would like to open the floor now for some questions and answers. Um, who can I? Yes, please. And thank you very much for being here. Of course, of course. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to, uh, first of all, to apologize for arriving late uh, due to uh, another meeting uh, and also to congratulate uh, the table for the excellent uh, exposition that uh, you made. Um, as I said before, my question was uh, mainly for um, the Commissioner Damanaki, but uh, uh, I will stress uh, the point that I wanted to bring uh, to discussion uh, anyway. We have been talking um, about uh, subsidies and also to um, uh, the subsidies as uh, uh, feeding um, these uh, overexploitations of uh, resources. Uh, I heard also that uh, we have to decrease, um, diminish the, the fleet. I never heard, uh, except for uh, Luis Rodriguez to talk about the artisanal uh, fleet, but I didn't hear here the distinction between uh, artisanal fleet and industrial fleet. And uh, we have to make that distinction. They are totally uh, different. Um, we are talking uh, about the, not only different sizes uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, boats, but also uh, a different relation to the environment, and the, a different relation uh, uh, at the social level too, because most of the artisanal uh, fleet is uh, for uh, family um, uh, income. And uh, uh, they generate not only uh, uh, a very specific and small economy for their own, for the, uh, for, for the family, but also a dynamic at the coastal area that is very important for society in general. So I truly believe that we uh, should not uh, start to discuss some of some of the issues that what uh, were brought out here to the table, uh, namely uh, the subsidies um, and the loss of jobs, without making the a very uh, good definition uh, of what is artisanal fleet, industrial fleet, 
uh, and to establish a different regime for both of them. Because we know perfectly well that it's not an artisanal fleet that is, uh, that is having a, a, a big impact on the, um, on the natural resources. And uh, if we don't make that distinction from the very beginning, instead of uh, giving a, a, a step ahead in what we want for this uh, reform, as it was said, this will be, this has to be a very strong reform because this is the, the last chance perhaps that we have uh, to, to have a fishery sector uh, balanced and uh, able to, to the challenge of, of the future. But we have to put everything on the table and to organize our ideas uh, around uh, these different issues. So for me, this distinction is paramount. And only after this distinction is made, uh, we can start discussing the other issues that were dealt here. And let me just add a very small uh, comment uh, still about the distinction uh, about um, artisanal and, and industrial fleet. Um, what is artisanal and uh, industrial is not the same from north to the south. Uh, we have to look not only to the size of uh, the, the boat, to how many uh, persons are working, on, uh, fishermen are working on the, that um, boat, but also to the capacity of fishing. Because we know that there are some regions in the European Union where a small boat with one or two fishermen has a very strong, uh, high capacity of, uh, of fishing. And uh, another boat that is larger, with more fishermen uh, on board, they have a lower capacity of fishing. So all these issues should be taken into account because we have to have a, a strong, um, uh, uh, a strong um, CFP, but also the support of the sector. And in order to, uh, to have that support, we have to be fair in addressing all these points. Thank you. You're, you're absolutely right in your statement. Um, it, it, I, I didn't find a question within it, um, and you wanted uh, the commissioner to react to your statement. Uh, but the others can do as well. It, it makes me think about a joke about an American banker who goes for one of his few holidays in the South, uh, in Central America, and he sees this guy going out on his boat in the morning, coming back with just one big fish. They eat it in his, with his family, and then he plays guitar on his terrace, and he does that every day. So this banker, after a week, goes to this fish and says, you should scale up. You can catch more than just one fish. And uh, so, yeah, well, why should I? Well, it's good for you. You can make more money, etc., etc. To make a very long story short, after some time, this guy uh, would have not only just one boat to catch one fish for his family, but numerous amounts of boats and lots of money. And then this fisherman asks this American banker, and okay, but then if I have these huge amounts of money, what can I do then? Well, then you can relax, sit on your terrace and play guitar. So if we talk about quality of life, I think that is the main thing and not trying to catch as many fish as possible. But uh, maybe someone else wants to react to this story as well. And I would like to apologize, yeah, Tony, because he has to leave for an urgent meeting with another commissioner. Does anyone want to react to the artisanal and industry fishing? No? Otherwise, we, we go to another question. Isabel? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, this splendid uh, event and lunch seminar. I, I, I wanted to react to uh, my colleague's comment on artisanal. artisanal. I completely agree that uh, there is very difficult to have a common definition on artisanal fisheries across Europe. And I, I believe in France right now we have a definition of, oh, of under 24 meters. 24 meters is in fact is in an industrial boat. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's very difficult and in some cases 
artisanal fishermen might even be very damaging to the marine environment as well, because uh, with the improvement of technology of today, even a small boat under 10 meters can have eco sound, can have uh, lots of, of technologies that more or less could find the lost fish of an, ex of, of an endangered uh, uh, species. So it's very difficult just to talk about small or big. So you have to talk about environmentally friendly or sustainable or not sustainable. That, I think, is the main issue. And I think that since fish is the property, it's a common owned resource. It's the, it belongs to all citizens, to the consumers, to the tourism industry, to every stakeholder uh, uh, and uh, future generations as well. We, as politicians, need to take the responsibility also in deciding who should have the right to fish. If we just have a, 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 a limited amount of fishing opportunities, then we can't just say that those that have fished most in the past should have the right to the same share of fishing in the future. So we think that you should have environmental, social uh, criteria to allocate fishing opportunities. Uh, this is a, a hard pill to swallow for the European Union. I think we've already gone through this with the commissioner. She says it's impossible to apply on a European level, but we could develop tools uh, and, and suggestions on such criteria on how to allocate fishing opportunities. And that has to be applied on a member state level. But I believe that if we're just not going to get, have ITQs, individual tradable quotas, those that have the most economic, uh, the, the, the biggest wallets can buy the fishing opportunities, then we also have to reserve certain uh, sectors or, or parts of the uh, fishing possibilities to those that we actually want to give fishing possibilities to. For instance, artisanal fishermen or those that fish in the most sustainable way, way using less uh, fuel, for instance, or having the most selective gears. Those, that, that is the kind of fishers we want to, to promote. And uh, so we have, to, we have to differentiate somehow, I think, on a member state level on how to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Guy Vernave. I'm uh, representing the catching sector at European level through the main uh, European umbrella organizations uh, called Europesh and Kojeka. I'd like to make a few comments. Uh, it's a bit of a shame that Commissioner Damanaki has disappeared, but I'm sure there are some representatives from DG Mare who are spread in the room so they can refer to what I've said to the Commissioner. And I would like to uh, raise a few things following precisely the intervention made by Commissioner Damanaki and also by Gus Pastor. I will try to be proactive and not defensive. Uh, of course, we are well aware within European and Kojeka of the problems encountered by the CFP. And just to mention a few ones uh, to be added to the list made by Maria Damanaki, I would uh, refer to the problem of discards, which is, of course, a huge one. Fleet overcapacity in certain segments of different fleets. Some overfishing, a lack of reliable data to assess most of the stocks, and also, as referred by Commissioner, the top-down micromanagement at EU level. And we therefore agree that there is a need to change the policy, including, as referred to by Gus Pastor, an effective regionalization, including also, as he mentioned and others, the involvement of stakeholders in the best possible way, and I would say particularly after the proposals, namely when uh, time will be for the implementation of the rules. And this not only at regional level, and there I'm referring to 
the RACs, the so popular RACs, but also at European level. And there I'm referring to the need to still consult ACFA, the Advisory Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture, or a similar forum if needed, and also the existing European organizations which are representative, like Europesh, COGECA, or IPSE. Let me now refer maybe to some of the key problems on discards. Can you, sir, can you make it brief? Because yeah. maybe other people would like to okay, I'll be brief. have either a statement or a question. Discards, I think we believe that uh, a maximum progressive reduction, fishery by fishery, should be a key priority of the future CFP. But instead of a pure and simple ban, there is a need for more scientific effort to develop gears and techniques to avoid unwanted catching. Yes, catches. sir, be, before you're going to read out your whole position paper. Uh, only two things. Okay. Four. Overfishing, because that's very popular. We take note of the Commission's clarification over the definition of this term in the recent communication on fishing opportunities for 2012. And we think uh, it's an important clarification. And finally, on the state of fish stocks, we welcome the Commission's acknowledgement that fish stocks in the European waters are improving. Therefore, we don't share the view that, as the title of this conference indicates, no fish is left on the plate. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, si es posible, um... If I may, uh, I'm from Galicia, and a few months back I was able to get to know the association represented by Mr. Rodriguez. It's a fisherman's association that's currently conducting an important environmental project. It's perhaps a first in Europe. Uh, because the small-scale fishermen themselves are carrying out an envir environmental sustainable, sustainable, sustainability project. The uh, Galicia authorities are not uh, supporting efforts to fight pollution which affects the stocks and uh, which is all about uh, stock conservation are focusing on macro-industrial fish farms in uh, areas that are of high ecological value. And this is having a major impact on uh, traditional small-scale fishing with selective gear, uh, which do not damage the seabed. So my question to Mr. Rodriguez, uh, could you possibly describe us what you're doing in, the, in terms of the estuary projects? Perhaps you could uh, talk about what you're clearing up where the Spanish and Galician authorities are failing to. Pues el proyecto que... Well, yes, the project we're carrying out, uh, and we've been doing it since 2006, is very uh, broad. Uh, so I'll try to illustrate as much as I can quickly. In the sector, we have to be involved ac actively. We can't just up ask for things, we have to do something. If we're pr to preserve stocks and uh, demonstrate that we're on the right loan, what we're doing is removing, removing waste from the seabed and the estuaries and along the coast uh, to demonstrate that we actually do want to beef up small-scale fishing. And as such, we do need to move towards sustainability and we need to make sure that there's greater environmental awareness. This has to begin with us, with our sector. And then the environmental uh, bodies working with us and other local authorities involved in the clean operation. Let me say that we've done 12 days of uh, the clean up operation. On Saturday, when we don't work, we use our uh, vessels and we use our crew to work up. We've cleared up 385,000 tons of waste, uh, nets, uh, all sorts of things. And what we're trying to do is to demonstrate that the sea is not the rubbish tip for the world. We can't continue down that road. So we need to have a clear will to do this. This is an experience that we uh, have demonstrated. We want to try uh, to 
given model. We want to make sure that we're being constructive, that we're working for the environmental. And this is an idea that stemmed from our sector. And we're still moving forward, as I said. And this is something I think that will really help. Well, that's impressive uh, commitment. The day that you do not work, you clean up the ocean. Incredible. Um, I see room for one last question. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is David Price uh, uh, of the Schumann Project. So I'm interested in uh, supranational solutions. Um, and the fisheries policy is actually one of the policies which is not supranational because it was, if you think about the beginning of it, it was d designed to make things very difficult for candidate countries. So what would be the supranational solution? I would like your reaction to this. The supranational solution for fisheries would be that the commission would be composed of, of people who are familiar with the fisheries uh, industry and economy and be in contact with people who, from all sectors who are involved. There would be a, uh, a committee which would be equivalent of what we have as the Economic and Social Committee and it would be composed of people like McDonald's, not McDonald's, but people who are consumers of fish in associations. It would be composed of fishery entrepreneurs who have to put a lot of money in buying ships. We can compose of the third section, workers in the fish industry. The commission would make a proposal and it would go to the Council of Ministers, which would have an open session, not a closed session. Um, and they would also go to the Economic and Social Committee, Fisheries Division, which would be an open session as well. And they would give their opinions and, uh, and on this, and the proposal would then be modified by the Commission. And after a series of, of uh, recycling of these uh, opinions, we get a refined proposal, which would be specifically about a specific point in the fisheries sector, which would then become European law. It would not be under the present situation where things are done in secret. So, um, and then you'd have the parliament involved in it, and you have the national parliaments involved. The council of ministers should be involved only when it comes to national interests, and so on. And you'd have the, you've got the court of law as well. So uh, the, the system is, is not really working as it should be. If you have that system, you have everybody involved, everybody involved in democratic and uh, process. The, the economic and social committee aspect is one of associations. So it's not of McDonald's being there, it's of associations of fish consumers. And it may be different types of fish, maybe tuna have a separate association, you know, and so on. But this is the vision that, that Schumann had right at the beginning for creating a, a democratic system. I'd like to know, can we get to that sort of position, which seems to be an ideal uh, governance system uh, in the fisheries industry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for these inspiring thoughts. Um, we took already one step into that direction by streamlining this meeting and making it, is it as open and transparent as possible. Um, is there anyone who would like to comment to these suggestions? It's more on the policy field, of course, but... Thank you. Um, thank you for your, your remarks. I think that uh, Guy Van Ava just just made some some points which are relevant in this in this uh, discussion. I mean, we have worked with a system where there was uh, at the uh, I would say at the supranational level an advisory committee for fishery affairs. This is still the forum where you will find the different associations which are representing both economic. Uh, uh, social, economic, workers, small scale, uh, industrial, everybody is, is, is represented. Now, um, I think we need to look at that structure uh, and probably need to look at uh, a more clear mandate for a type of uh, advisory committee like this. And uh, it's been a frustration for many people over many years that they have given advice which was lost somewhere in the drawer and the people felt that their input was not really valued. Uh, so I think we do have uh, some of these structures. We also have the regional advisory committees set up. I think it's a great step in the right direction. We've seen that, uh, that, that stakeholder involvement has improved, and especially we've seen there that 
uh, the, the cooperation between uh, NGOs and, and economic operators has improved, and what we need there is that we get the people from the science better improved so that we have the, the total picture for those who want to assess the stocks. So, so I can go a long way in, in what you're trying to express as a, an ideal situation, but I think we have some elements which we can improve to get a bit in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Pastor, and I would like to conclude uh, the meeting, but not before uh, thanking Chris Davies, uh, especially as one of the, or the founder of uh, the Fish for the Future group, um, and for organizing uh, this meeting, um, and thanking the, the speakers for being so outspoken and uh, constructive in their uh, approach. Um, I always believe that images are stronger than words, and when I saw Mr. Roberts' first pictures of these huge fish in at the beginning of the previous century, I was thinking about how my children would react if I took them to a fish market in the, in the 1920s. I think they would believe that these were dinosaur fish instead of the fish that they see on the, on the market now. I think that image is so strong that things have changed. Uh, dramatically and that we have to do something that is much stronger than all the words we are um, saying today. Um, you also mentioned um, shortly the report that was published on Monday by uh, IUCN and the International Program for the State of the Oceans, the of the Oceans um, which did not only concentrate on overfishing but also on the pollution the climate effects uh, and other effects on the oceans. And I recommend everyone to read it. It's, it's rather dramatic. And uh, we are here only tackling one of the issues, but it's one of the issues that we could most easily tackle in the short notice. Uh, it's much easier to tackle that one than uh, the climate change effects, which will cost uh, much, much more time. Um, I believe that worldwide we spend about $27 billion on uh, fisheries subsidies. And the weird thing is that um, I always believe that subsidies must have a positive effect. And somehow these uh, subsidies, this $27 million billion uh, have a dramatic effect on the environment. And as was uh, explained today, also on the social and economic dimensions of the whole sector. Um, that's why I'm always pleading for uh, getting rid of subsidies that have a negative effect on either biodiversity or the environment in general. And let's think of the enormous amount of money that we're spending on it and what we could do if we spend it in a much wiser, uh, wiser way, $27 billion around the globe. Um, I've listened carefully to all the speakers. Uh, I was impressed especially by uh, the way they share the beliefs that we need a radical change. That was the title of this, uh, this seminar. Uh, that they all ask for a long-term vision um, and that they all believe that if we, as Tony Long uh, put it, if we don't take the uh, environment the environment as a preeminent goal, then we will have no fish in the future anymore. And without fish, there is no industry. I think that is one of the most uh, important conclusions of, uh, of this seminar. Um, I hope, being this an open and transparent uh, meeting, streamlined, I hope that people from the seven or six countries that uh, made this statement last week not to change anything on the a common fisheries policy, that they listened to what the Commissioner and the other speakers have said today. I don't understand why uh, you could find any arguments or how you could find any arguments for not wanting a radical change um, unless you're, you're blinded by short-term interests instead of the, not even long-term, but even the medium-term interests. Um, and I think that is, that is one of the most important uh, conclusions. The coming 18, 18 months, we will be discussing the common fisheries policy, I'm afraid. Uh, it will be a fierce debate. It will be an emotional debate. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the outcome will be a radical change. 
Um, I hope that the speakers who were here uh, are willing to participate in this debate, not only in public, but also behind closed doors towards member states and um, uh, members of parliament, European and at national level, because there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you all for being here and uh, hope to see you at the next uh, ALDA seminar. Thank you very much. Yes. One short comment, because this is about the MSY, which we are committed to have for all fish stocks in Europe by 2015. The Baltic cod is one of the few stocks in Europe which actually are on MSY level today. And it took us five years to get there. And we have like four and a half years to get the rest of the stock up there. And the Baltic cod was the easy one. Thank you.